oldest calendar known to man. It is not. The book of Revelation is the oldest calendar known to man. And hopefully in the next few days when this Mayan calendar is done, we'll get back to the original prophecies. Amen? Amen. So for those of you who are planning to uh, give away all your properties before the 21st, <laughs> just give them to me, right? <laughs> uh, sadly, sadly in our world, uh, we're so far removed from God that um, there are already reports of parents who are planning to kill their children <laughs> so that they don't suffer on the 21st. There are already people uh, running up and maxing out their credit cards, and um, <laughs> the 22nd is going to be a bad day. <laughs> uh, maxing, <laughs> maxing out their credit cards and um, lots of silly stuff. So I pray and believe that none of you are going to be involved in any of those practices. <laughs> that was a weak amen right there. But I'm just praying that none of you will be a part of any of those practices. Um, if anything, 12, 12, 12, 12 is, the, 12 is the perfect number of God. And um, all the, the, the sun and the moon go through the constellations, the 12 constellations. And once they're through all those constellations, we say it's the end of the year. The calendar year has gone by. So if we say anything, three twelves mean it's a great time to live in the finality of God. It's a great, it's a, this would be a great day to declare, this could be a great day to declare that the best of your life is right ahead of you. Yeah. Amen. And um, everything else is behind you as of this day, all right? So that's all I'm going to say about that. Tonight we're going to talk uh, from this subject, confidence in the seed. Confidence in the seed. And I'm going to leave enough time at the end for you to ask questions. So you, you may have gotten a, a sheet of paper there that you can write your question on and we'll read them at the end. Um, the series that we're teaching from is uh, Reaping the Harvest. I believe it's harvest time. I believe that uh, 2013 is gonna be a year of great harvest. And for lots of us, for many of us, it's starting already. Um, uh, doors are opening, opportunities are coming uh, into the next year. I believe and hope that you are a part of that. Uh, I believe and hope that you Amen. are a part of that. Am I monotone tonight? Am I? Okay. All right. Man. Okay. All right. Let's get into the word. Confidence in the seed. Genesis 8 and 22 is where we start. We're sort of using that as our baseline scripture for these teachings. And Genesis 8 and 22, rather, Genesis 8, 22 says, while the earth remains, read it with me, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Now, he could have taken that cold and heat, winter and summer out, but that's God's idea. So God says, while the earth remains, while the earth is still here, seed time and harvest will have its grip and its saying on the planet. Cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night, shall not cease, shall not cease, shall not cease. Well, I don't like it. Has nothing to do with what you like. They don't like it. Has nothing to do with what they like. They don't teach it. Has nothing to do with what they teach or what they believe, what denominations believe. This is God the King who created both, who's saying this is how it works. This is how it works. Seed time and harvest, all right? So I want you to write down these eight things, just some more Martinisms. You can... So you can turn them into whatever you, however you want to write them. But as we talk tonight, I want you to remember these eight or so points. First of all, God never intended your job to provide for you. Amen. Never, never, never. And when people say, so, so if, you, if, so if you're, you're at a job that only pays so much, that's, just remember, that's not how you're supposed to live. No one is on a fixed income. And I hear people say, well, I'm on a fixed income, so I can only give so much. No, you're not on a fixed, home, fixed income. As a matter of fact, if you want to say you're on a fixed income, then I can prove to you that you fix it. <laughs> you fix the income. You fix the income in God's system. All right? So God never intended your job to provide for you. 
Number two, he intended to provide for you through your work, not your job. <coughs> through your work. God wants to provide for me through my work. What is my work? Let's talk about God's work first. God's work, God's work is sowing and reaping. That's how God works. That's how God lives. He lives by sowing and reaping, whether that's his words, his, his time, how he speaks over us, his energy. God lives by sowing and reaping. So number four, <clears throat> your work is operating in God's earthly law of sowing and reaping. I mean, three. Did I say four? Yeah. Three. Okay. All right, then. Three. Three. Hold up. God's number one, God never intended. Okay, let me teach this. God never intended. God never intended your work to provide for you. Number two, he intended to provide for you through your work. Number three, God lives or God operates by sowing and reaping. So number four. Number four, your work is operating. Your work, this is your work, operating in God's law of sowing and reaping. That is your work. Everything you and I do is sowing and reaping. And your job is just one place you sow and reap. It's not supposed to be the only place you sow and reap. What number is it? Five. Okay, good. Number five. <laughs> number five, God, God's process, God's process of supplying for your abundant life is in reaping a harvest. His process of providing for your abundant life is reaping a harvest. Say it with me. God's process of providing for my abundant life is reaping a harvest. His process of, of providing for or of supplying for my abundant life is reaping a harvest. So then, number six, God gives me seed to participate in his process. I know. I know it's good, isn't it? <laughs> okay. It was good to me, too. It's good to me when I... <laughs> so, God gives me seed. I don't have to quote that scripture necessarily, but God gives seed to the sower. Some nice shoes. So, uh, God gives me what I need. He gives me seed so that I can participate in his law. That's what the seed is for. The, the, the seed is not to make me fat. They say corn fed. Okay. But, but the, the seed, the corn is not to make me fat. They use it to fatten up cows. We're not cows. The seed is given to us so that we can participate in God's process. As a matter of fact, this is not on my list, but God never asked me for something he hasn't given me. He never, he never asked me for anything he hasn't given me. And when he comes to ask for something from me, it means he's already given it to me. And, and he wants to do something in my life that will take that seed to do it. And if I don't see the seed, okay, I'm going to get back to my list, <laughs> teach for a minute. But if I, don't see, if I don't see it right, if I don't see the seed right, I don't see him right, then I choke when he comes to me. <clears throat> and when I choke, I am now no longer participating in the system, in the law. And you're, you're never neutral on the planet. You're never neutral. If you're not participating in God's principle and God's law, 
There is another law, Paul said. So as soon as you as soon as you decide God's law doesn't work, you immediately are thrown into the second law. And that's the law of the earth curse system. So so we can have Christians who are praying, expecting to live a certain way, do a certain thing for our families, be a blessing to the world. But we're living it. We're living in a system that is cursed. What numbers next? Seven. Wonderful. Sometimes, sometimes, say sometimes, sometimes, sometimes God will require a certain seed for a certain harvest. Sometimes God will require a certain seed for a certain harvest. Sometimes. You have something you desire. God knows how much that costs in seeing it. Can we talk tonight? I mean, not like Christians, but kingdom citizens. All right. Number eight, last one. Number eight. If you are confidently convinced in God's process, you will never have lack. Never. Nunca. That's never in Spanish. I learned that when I was in Honduras. How you say never in y'all's language? Mucho, <laughs> Mucho nunca. <laughs> Much never. <laughs> <laughs> you, will, you will never have lack. <coughs> That's eight, right? Yeah. Wonderful. So let's rehearse this scripture, and I'm going to show you the difference and teach you some stuff tonight. Uh, let's rehearse... Um, Second, second uh, Corinthians nine and six. Let's rehearse this. We taught this on Sunday, but I want to rehearse it tonight because I want to show you the difference. Is that all right? Okay. Uh, second Corinthians nine six says, "But this I say: He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He he who and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he has." Purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, not a necessity for God loves the cheerful giver. You're still turning? Okay. God loves the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace. You should say it out loud. God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Hallelujah. Right. Here's the key with this verse. This verse is saying that whatever I sow, I reap. Okay, follow me. In, in whatever, if I sow a little, I'm going to reap a little. If I sow a lot, I'm going to reap a lot. Let me shoot this thing flying around the room. Because the sin nature of me and you is for us to see sowing and reaping as evil. We immediately go to all the stuff we've done wrong, all the bad seeds we've sown, all the mistakes we've made. We're going to reap from that also. But let me remind you, 90% of what you do, even if it's 90% of what you do is not bad. And of that 10% of the mistakes we make, they're not necessarily on purpose for most of us. It's stuff, it's life, mistakes, some, some intentional, some not intentional. But God, God knows how to deal with negative harvest Amen. by overwhelming you with positive harvest. Amen. Amen. There's always more wheat than tares. Okay. That's a dead buzzard right out of the sky right there. Okay. So if I sow a little, I reap a little. If I sow a lot, I reap a lot. Here's the problem with this verse. Hold on. The problem with this verse is if my dream doesn't match match what I sow, I never get to my dream. In this verse, in this verse, my reaping only depends on my sowing. What if I could show you in scripture that when you get to a relationship in God, God knows your heart and what you desire and he knows the sowing you need to sow. 
Okay, this is deep, but it's not deep. It's all over scripture. That he, 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 knows, he knows the seed that is required for what's in your heart. And when you get to a certain level in God, God will ask you for the seed required for where you're trying to go. And if you don't understand how God works, you'll choke on the, at that moment. And you won't give the seed he's asking for. Is this too much? Somebody on the internet say amen. It's cold in here. Okay, so let, so let me prove it to you in the word. Let me show you something in the word. Okay, okay, all right. It's not for everybody. Tonight's not for everybody. I get it. But for some of you, you're going to get this, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to open up a whole new world for you. Okay? All right. Because God doesn't want the dreams I have for my children. God, God, doesn't want, God, God never expected me to, to be able to earn that on my job. Never. My, my paycheck, that direct deposit, however you get it, it's seed. It can't pay for where you're headed. Okay, the hero of our faith in Romans 4, I'm just going to, it's a little bit of scripture. I want to read through it though. Romans 4, 16 says, therefore it is a faith that it might be recorded to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not only to those who, Romans 4, 16 through 22. But also to those who are of faith, are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you a father to many nations in the presence of him who believe. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Who contrary to hope. Listen about Abraham, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, there's something spoken back here. There's something spoken. So shall your descendants be. Looking up at the stars, you see it? Now listen, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise. He did not waver. He did not choke. He did not choke at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and this phrase, underline it, and being fully convinced, fully convinced what? That what God had promised, he was also able to perform. Something happened in Abraham's life. We're in Hebrews, which is New Testament. Something happened in Abraham's life where he had to become convinced because he was not always convinced at what God said to him. Just like you and me in here tonight. A lot of us are not convinced at what God showed us. A lot of us are not even convinced at what he told us today in prayer. We're not, we're not convinced. We know he's a good God. We're not necessarily convinced that he'll do it for us. I said convinced. But Abraham became convinced. Let's read how he became convinced. Genesis 14. Let's go back. He became convinced. He became convinced. God counted it as righteousness. He became the father of us all in faith. He is father Abraham who blessed us all in faith. Genesis 14. We read this. This is Bible night, right? Okay. In Genesis 14, we read this a couple of weeks ago, but I want to reiterate it today. I want you to see something. First of all, uh, verse uh, verse 22, I guess. But Abraham said to King, this, this is after he defeated the five kings, right? After he defeated the five kings. And Lot and brought everybody home. Remember that from a couple weeks ago? Yes. Okay. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take nothing. He's Mississippi talk right there. I will not take nothing. He didn't say I will not take anything. He said, I will take, I will, I will take nothing. 
I will take nothing from, from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you say, I have made Abraham rich, except only what the young men have eaten, and the portion that goes to the men who were with me. All these guys who fought alongside me, give them their portion. So you see the tithe. Okay, okay. He says, I won't bow to anyone, but he gave a tenth. He gave a tenth to Melchizedek. He gave 10% to Melchizedek. You can't make me rich. Already lifted my hands to the Lord. I've already decided that I live in the Lord's system. I'm not going to substitute God's system. I'm not going to live outside of God's system. I'm not going to say I'm living in it and then live a lie and not tithe. Hello? Okay. I'm not going to do that. I would, I would rather, I would rather be, I would rather be, I would, I would rather be in business with a stone cold sinner than in business with a Christian who doesn't tithe. Because Christians who, Christians who don't tithe are lukewarm. You're saying something that you don't believe in. But at least a sinner who's straight up, straight out, you know who he or she is. Okay. All right, then. Okay. So now let's keep reading. Verse 15. Uh, verse 15. Let's see. Okay. After the after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. And Abram said to God, Lord, are we there? Yes. yes. Did I, what did I say? 15th chapter? Verse 1. Okay, sorry. Then let's start over. <laughs> I want you to get this. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. He's already given his tithe. He's already given his tithe. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. Who? Who's your shield? God is your shield. Who's your exceeding great reward? God is. God is. I'm your shield. I'm your exceeding great reward. But Abraham has this thing now. Listen to Abraham. Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. I have no child. I'm 100. But I have no child. And indeed, one born in my house will be my heir. I've done all this stuff. I have all this money. I have all this land. I have all these animals. But I don't have a son or a daughter to give it to. And now Eliezer, an old man, in my house is going to have all this stuff. In other words, Abram is saying, how you made all these promises to me. You've shown me this future. You've, you said the stars are going to be like my children. You said the sand is going to be in my inheritance. Now, I want to know how is this going to happen? Verse 4, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir. But one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Yeah. Then he brought him outside. Here it goes again. Look up toward the heavens. Abraham is like, look, you know what? We've been looking at the stars for 25 years, truly. We look, look, God, <laughs> at 75, you came and bothered me in my daddy's house and showed me the stars. I'm tired of looking at stars. I want a crying, suckling, pooping, peeing baby. That's what I want. I want no stars. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, maybe that's how I felt. Abraham <laughs> brought him outside. Look now at the heavens and count the stars if, you can, if you're able to count them. And he said, so shall your descendants be, right? 
and Abraham, not Martin, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, here's the question. Verse seven. You there? Read it. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur into the child of the Chaldeans to give you this land. Keep reading. Mm -hmm. And he said, how? Here's his question. I know you brought me out of Ur. We don't talked about this. <laughs> you brought me to this place. I get it. You've shown me the stars. I got it. You see, he cut him off before he said the sand, didn't he? He said, I know, you, I know where you're going. You're going to sand. We've already done sand. We've done stars. We've done sand. I can show you pictures of the stars on my iPad, pictures of the sand. I got videotapes. I got, I got videotapes of the sand going through my hands. I've tried to count them on my, I understand that. What I want to know how do we make this happen? How are you going to do this? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you know you know what I'm saying? I got a dream. Ain't no problem. What I want to know is how. How are we going to get this thing out of my head, my heart, and my spirit into the realm? I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about sowing an acre of seed. I want to know, forget, forget, for, for, forget how much I think I need to sow. I need you to tell me what do we need to make this happen? Okay, I'm, I'm teaching this tonight because, because there are some of you who are saying, you know what, Pastor? I've been sowing, I've been tithing, I've been sowing, but this stuff ain't happening for me. Right? So watch what happens. So God says, Abraham says, how's this going to happen? What did God say? Bring me an offering. <laughs> he says, bring me an offering. I want five things. This is a whole nother level of breakthrough, abundant breakthrough in your life. Listen, bring me an offering. Bring me a three-year-old heifer. That's a cow. <laughs> bring me a three-year-old female goat. You have to straighten some people out. Bring me a three-year-old ram. Bring me a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Later on, he asked for Isaac too, right? Okay. So he says, bring me this particular offering. So he brought these to him. He cut them in two. He divided them. He put them in the middle, pieces on each side, opposite of the other. But he did not cut up the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. I'll come back to that. He drove them away. And now the sun was going down, and a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, a horror, a great darkness, this is God, fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, this is God. So, so listen to what happened. Abram says, God says, this is what I'm going to do. Abram says, how am I going to know you're going to do it? God says, bring me an offering. Do with that offering what I say. He cuts up the offering, cuts up the offering, lays the carcasses of the cow opposite the goat, opposite and what else was it no the ram lays the, the opposite halves opposite and now God comes down himself he puts Abraham to sleep well let me just go ahead and tell you this right so when when Abraham cuts up when Abraham cuts up the carcasses immediately in the air the enemies of his seed come to take it buzzards and fowl of the air come to eat it. Abraham does everything he has to do to shoo them away. Okay, what, what does that mean, Pastor? Thank you so much. So what that means is when you start to believe in sowing and reaping and giving an offering, people are not going to understand you. It's not going to make sense. So you got buzzards or vultures, I'm sorry. You got vultures who come. Vultures say, why are you doing this, stupid? Vultures say, uh, God's never answered your prayer before. Vultures say, uh, God is not in this at all. So you got to fight off. You got to fight off buzzards and vultures of unbelief. 
that don't believe in this seed system. They don't, they don't believe. You, you got to fight off buzzards. They might look like mama. I mean, I mean, I mean relatives. Some of you are fighting uh, vultures at home. You're married to one who don't even, don't look around. Don't say nothing. No cam All the cameras are on me. And you're fighting this at home where spouses don't understand and don't believe in it. So he fought them. And then God came and said, you know, this really isn't your fight. <laughs> this is so good. Look, when you put a seed in the ground, when you put a seed in the ground, the Bible says you go home and go to sleep. And when you go to sleep, that I watched all day for about an hour on YouTube today while I was studying, and I just clicked on every uh, every frame of see. You know they can, they can uh, they can speed up the video, they can lapse those videos, and I just watched them how seed germinate in the ground, unbeknownst to us, underground, out of sight. We don't understand how seed grows. We don't understand how it does it in God either. But I don't really care. I don't really care. It doesn't really matter. And like, like, like Abram now, he protects it. And then God says, listen, this is really on me. You're inside my system now. You're in my world of seed, time, and harvest. God comes down in the middle of the carcasses, and this is where we get the infinity sign. He walked in the figure of eight among the blood and the guts and spoke to Abram. As God is walking, he's talking. This is how Abraham became convinced. When the sun went down, he says, no, certainly that your descendants will be strangers in the land. He starts telling Abram this story. There'll be strangers in this land. But I'm going to give you a nation. Verse 15. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You'll be buried at an old age. How much would it cost to get that kind of word from God? But in the fourth generation now, he's telling the truth. They're going to walk away from me. They're going to walk. He's telling him the whole lineage. And finally, in, finally, in verse 18, on the same day that the Lord made a covenant with Abraham in that offering. To your descendants, I will give this land for the, from the river, from, from the river to, of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And then he names a bunch of ites. And folks in there. So God says, listen, I'm coming down and I'm requiring you a certain offering <coughs> to get you to this next level where you're called. And I'm glad we've already received our offering tonight. So I'm not trying to get any money from you, but I'm trying to get some money to you. Right. And, and maybe you'll receive this as I tell my story. And people say, well, pastor, you've told this story a million times. I know, but I'm sort of like David. When he killed Goliath, he carried that stinking head around with him for years. He just carried it and said, hey, don't mess with me. But after, but, after, but after taking 45 years, 45 years to save $200,000, the mistake we made, my wife and I, was going to the Lord and saying, Lord, we, we, want, we want to be for our families. We want to leave for our children this many millions of dollars. We want to leave this for them. We want to leave a legacy of wealth for our children. And we want to provide for them at a certain level. We don't just want to die and they get to enjoy it and we're asleep somewhere. Right? So, so the Lord, bottom line, said, okay, you got $200,000 to save you this long. Now, that dream, I want you to sow that into the church building. So $197, $193 and about 50 cents went into this church. God was gracious to leave us $3,000. <laughs> so if you ever see us living a certain way, you got to go back to the sea and, and don't be mad. You know, God asked for it. We gave it. We didn't choke, all right? Huh? Okay, so, so don't be upset. Some girl was upset with my daughter about how she was living. And I just told her, I said, go ahead and tell her. Tell her you ain't got nothing. You're driving my stuff. <laughs> you ain't got nothing. Your name ain't on nothing. Tell her don't be mad at you. Tell her you broke. <laughs> so, so 
That drink six, six and a half, seven years ago when that seed was sown, since then multiplied five, six times, well, seven, eight times, just that seed. Because God knows the seed required for where you're going. So in other words, I'm going to be the wrong person to talk to when you start making excuses for what God's asking you for. That's not going to work when you talk to me. Y'all awful tight-lipped. Okay, so here it is. Let me give you some more proof. Are y'all all right with this? Talked a little bit about this last week. Uh, uh, Mark 10, when the rich young ruler came to God, his question was this. Mark 10, 17 through 22. His question was, how do I get your lifestyle? Jesus, how do I get your lifestyle? How do I live like you? Mark 10, 17 through 22. How do I get your life? Verse 18, Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? There's no one good. Only God is good. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't default. Honor your father and mother. And the rich young ruler said, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. This this expression is going to be an expression of love. Because this rich young ruler, we're not certain he stole this money. He probably inherited it. He probably inherited it from his father, from his lineage. Right? Right? I've done all these things from my, from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, there's one thing you lack. There's one thing, there's one thing in this kingdom economy that you lack. And let's get it straight. Go your way, whatever you have, sell it, and bring it back and give it to Judas. You you have to study this. Okay, he says give it to the poor, but this is what he meant. Judas, read your Bible. Judas carried a money bag for the poor. So wherever Jesus went, he blessed the poor. Y'all know that, right? Okay. So he says, now, go sell everything you have. Watch him. I'll I'll prove it. He says, go sell everything you have, bring the money back, give it to Judas, and then follow me. Sell everything you have. Now, the guy just asked for Jesus' lifestyle. He didn't ask to be saved. (laughs) Okay? Bunch of saved, broke people. He's not asking to be saved. He's asking... I want to live like you. I want to. I want to. I want. I want. I want. I want to find gold in the fish's mouth. I want to be laid hands on people. They recover. I want to live in your lifestyle. So Jesus says, everything you got is going to be required for this. Your offering is everything. Well, you know what the what the rich young ruler did. He was sorrowful. He walked away. He didn't understand the system. I can prove to you he didn't understand. He didn't understand what Jesus was trying to do to him and for him. You go down to the 29th verse and we begin to see what Jesus was thinking. Jesus never expected this rich young ruler to live off the money he had. It won't get you eternal life. Sowing and reaping is the only thing that gets you eternal life. That's it. So listen to what Jesus said. I tell you the truth. He replied, no one, you know, why don't we go up a verse above that? Go go up a verse above um, the 29th verse. Mark 10 and 28, what does that say? Go above that. What's the verse above? (laughs) Okay, go ahead. What's the next verse? And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, Among themselves, who then can be? Okay, go back a verse up. Y'all got, you see this, right? Did you just see it? Yeah. Okay, go, go a verse up. Go a verse up. I'm, I'm telling you, man, these pictures, these pictures and stupid stories about Jesus being poor and his disciples being poor, don't believe it. Okay, okay, 
Okay, it's easy for a camel to go through. I have a needle. Now, now, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, Chris. Look, he says, he says, look, it's hard for a rich man to go, not to heaven, but to be in the kingdom. You know what he said? So the next verse, what does it say? It's, it's hard for a rich man. Watch this. And they, they, not one of them, all the disciples, Jesus said, <laughs> it's hard for a rich man. They're like, huh? <laughs> Rut row, Scooby. They're like, <laughs> hold up. Did he just say, it's hard for rich people to get into the kingdom. Is that what he said? They said it to one another. Peter asked the question out loud. <laughs> Peter said what? Who then can be saved? Peter's like, all us rich. <laughs> Me, <laughs> John, Bartholomew, Matthew, all us got money. Matthew was a tax collector. Right. Brothers loaded. Luke was a doctor. These guys got money. Pete owned boats, not one. So Pete says, hold up. No rich people can go to heaven? So Jesus had to help him. Now, with man, this is impossible. <laughs> but with God, it's, impo it's possible. In other words, People, people who have riches are a blessing to God. Riches who have people are cursed. See, I can be proud. My wife and I can be proud that we wrote a $200 check. Here's the problem. It wasn't our money. wasn't ours. And he can come and ask me for anything he wants, especially if it answers the question of a certain harvest in my life. I'm not sure you know how good this is. Tell your neighbor, don't choke. So here's what he says. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied. Listen to what Jesus says. I was trying to help the young man. No one who has left home, brothers, sisters, mother or father or children feels for me and the sake of the gospel will fail to receive 100 times as much in this present age, God is not going to repay my $200,000 in heaven. There ain't no way. There's no way when I get to heaven, God's going to say, here's your reward. And hand me some gold. I don't need no gold in heaven. In this present age, and he lists them, homes, yes. brothers, sisters, mothers, children, children who have either passed away, you're going to receive what feels, and with them, persecution. We'll get back to that. Yes. With increase in the system comes persecution, but in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last shall be first. Let me tell you about the rich young ruler, this scripture points back to the prophecy that the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the just. So now, those who participate in this system of sowing and reaping, especially giving God the offering he asks for, those people, we, we's people, us's, folks's, we are going to get that wealth of the wicked restored to us. <clears throat> we that wealth that the wicked has. They're good stewards of it. But the days are coming that us who participate in sowing and reaping 
This system yeah. is turning, it's doing it now. Yeah. It's turning upside down yeah. and that wealth is being transferred because it's not leaving the planet. Right. It's being transferred into the hands of the righteous. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let me read another one to you. These are good, good, good. Uh, second, second, second Chronicles 1, 7. Second Chronicles 1, 7. Second Chronicles 1, 7. Got it? Yes? What does it say? <coughs> on, on that night, God appeared to Solomon, said to him, ask. Now read the first, read the first three words again. Now listen, on that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask, what shall I give you? What do you want on that night? On a particular night, God came to Solomon and said, what do you want? What can I give you? On a particular night, God appeared. God showed up and appeared to Solomon and asked him, what do you want? Okay, on, on that night. Now, what do you want to know? What night was that? What, what, now, what do I got to do? What, what do I got to do? To be in, in, in that night, D-A-T, right? What do I got to do to be in that night? How many of y'all want a night like that one? Right, I do too. But we got to go above it to read. <laughs> okay, we got we to gotta go above it. We got to go up to verse two. <laughs> that night, that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, listen, what, what do you want? Just ask me. Jesus. Here it is. Solomon spoke to all Israel and the captains of thousands and hundreds, the judges and every leader in Israel, the heads of the father's houses. Then Solomon said, then Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place that was in Gibeon. For the tabernacle of meeting with God was there, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness. But David had brought up the ark of God from and mm -hmm, to place it to the place David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem. Now the bronze altar that mm -hmm, the son of the son of had made, he put before the tabernacle of God, Solomon and the assembly. Verse 6, read it. And Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord and now read the next verse. <laughs> you want the wisdom of the world? You can't write no $10 check. <laughs> you might start with one, but that's not going to be the last thing God asks you for. A thousand bull offerings? God showed up himself. <laughs> Boy, what you want? <laughs> We wrote, that, we wrote that check and went home and prayed. And the presence of the Lord came in our bedroom. And we felt like we were supposed to tell God what we wanted. And we said to the Lord, we want to be the first generation in either of our families, in the history of our families, as far back as we can see. We want to be the first. We want to be the first to be multimillionaires. We want to be the first on record to take care of our, fam our mom and dad. We want to be the first to build them property. We want to be the first to leave millions to our children. We've made this list of what we wanted. Now, we got $3,000 in the bank. Mm. 
that's right, your pastor seven years ago, $3,000, that's it. So now, pastor, I guess you live day to day. No, heck no. I'm not going to give an offering like that and then get scared. Amen. That ain't going to happen. No, no. Ain't no buzzards going to steal my harvest. I'm sorry, vultures. Well, y'all don't say buzzards here, do you? Y'all say those here? Okay. I, 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 no vulture, no bird of the air going to steal my harvest. Ain't going to happen. So what did we do? We kept sowing. We go travel, we sow, and we sow. Here comes opportunities, and we sow. Here comes another opportunity, and we sow. Buy that land, you're not gonna use it, you're gonna sell it, and you're gonna make double what you bought it for in recession, buy the land. It's like money started coming. We get to go home next week, pick out a house for Pastor Mel's parents. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, baby. Hey, ask your neighbor, like my children say at home. Like my children say at home. Ask your neighbor, are you mid? Are you mid? <laughs> You're not mid, are you? <laughs> Old folks say, what do you say? What do you say? <laughs> Are you mad? No. <laughs> okay. Amen. Matthew 26. I'm almost done. Go ahead. <laughs> Matthew 26 and 6. While Jesus was in Bethany, while Jesus in Bethany of the man who's known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive <coughs> perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw it, they were indignant. Why this waste? The perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. This is Judas talking. And he was the only poor person being helped from the bag. Right. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothered by this woman? Listen to her. She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor are the unproductive, underline it, the unproductive you will have always. And no, I'm not Mitt Romney. I'm reading from the Bible. You will, you will always have unproductive people. Right? You'll always have unproductive people. But you will, you, you will not always have me, he said. And when she poured perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. And I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached, listen to her reward, listen to her harvest. Wherever this gospel is preached, Martin in 1212 12 is going to have to preach about her. Everybody's going to have to preach about her all over the world because of what she's done. Luke, the physician, has more detail. Luke, the physician, says this in Luke 36. He says, uh, now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who lived a sinful life, Luke 7, 36. What did I say? There is no Luke 36. Okay, Luke 7, 36. Y'all there now? Luke 7, 36. Okay. She brought an alabaster jar, verse 38. <clears throat> and as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to weep at his feet with her tears. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, and he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, I mean, if he, if he was a real man of God, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him. Jesus reads minds, you know. Simon, I have something to tell you. And he asked him a question. If two, people, if two people owe somebody and one owes a person the most and he forgives them both, which one is going to be the most 
uh, loving to him. Well, this woman is a sinner. She had much. She had much to be forgiven for, and I forgave her. So the offering she brought was equivalent to what she needed. What she needed from me was equivalent to one year's salary. What she, what she desired was equivalent. What she desired, the offering matched it. Verse 47, therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. Her many sins have been forgiven. For she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Here it is, folks. To live this kind of lifestyle of giving at this level because you can't give at that level. You cannot give what God requires of you and live at a low level. Anytime you give what he's asking for, there's going to be a harvest that comes from that. And that harvest is going to be multiples of what he asked for. And that harvest is what you're going to live by. You're not going to do what you're trying to do in your family or business with the job. You have to do it with the seed. And when you and God get serious, when you and God get serious, he's going to match your desire with the seed. And in that moment of truth, some of you are having it now, in that moment of truth, you're either going to choke or you're going to give it. I, I, told, I, told, I told the person, say years ago, somebody say years ago. They're not in the church now. Say it. They're not in the church. Say it. Say it again. Man, you got to watch Christians, I'm telling you. Not in the church now. But, but every year for my birthday, this particular person would send me a card. And this was back when I'm choking on the card. You know, a card that costs five bucks. I'm like, for real. Just, just, just write a note or something. Card, look on the back of the card, it's five bucks. And finally I asked the secretary at the time, can you check and see if this person's this person tithed? The secretary checked, this person hadn't tithed, been in our church forever. No record. So I told the person the next Sunday, don't give me nothing. Save this up and pay your tithe. You, 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 um, you can't impress a person and get to God. See what I'm saying? <laughs> the best bean counter in the universe. The best accountant in the universe is God. What is pastor trying to do tonight? Pastor's trying to say to you, number one, God has a requirement for where you're trying to go. Okay, okay, okay. Let's forget God for a minute. Okay? Can, can I do this? Now, don't nobody send me no email. Don't ask me after church what I'm talking about. You hear what I'm saying? I was approached by a group of businessmen. The leader of the group said, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in God. You Christians do what you do. I do what I do. I make money. And these are some of the wealthiest men in town. He said, but we have been watching you. I said, cool, sweet. He said, let's meet. I said, let's meet. We talked about ideas. We talked about making money. We talked about, he says, you're involving yourself in making Christians wealthy. I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, how's that going? He was kind of making fun of me. I said, it's no big deal.